Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com, on Roku, Dwyer Boxing, and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let's jump into it. I'm expecting Andre Ward to dominate Paul Smith. Understand the competitive advantage that Andre Ward has. Right, I spent uh, a bit of time looking at a lot of social media, a lot of boxing videos here online. I'll talk about one person who does these videos shortly, and um, it was interesting looking at these camps, seeing fighters working on certain skills that they hadn't developed in the past. Understand, with Andre Ward, it's completely a different story. Right? His strength is the fact that if a fight style can be considered a language, he speaks several languages. Right, He's a guy who, quite frankly, has worked on his entire game from day one. Right, In other words, you know, it's like looking at basketball, looking at We'll pick a player, right? Perhaps the best I've seen, Michael Jordan. And, you know, you understood that Jordan, as dominant as he was offensively, and for those of you who believe that LeBron's the best ever, just look at Jordan's offensive numbers, right? As dominant as Jordan was offensively, Jordan, from day one, worked on being not a good defender, not an above average defender, but the best defender in the league, right? Understand that Jordan, whose three-point shot wasn't that great, worked on that shot to the point where Jordan in the NBA Finals was hitting threes with such regularity against the Portland Trail Blazers that at one point he shrugs to the crowd. Right? Understand that Jordan, the consummate slasher to the rim, developed back to the basket skills, where his signature move later in his career was a turnaround jumper off of his back to the basket. That's Andre Ward. Right? When you see Andre Ward, understand you're only seeing a part of Andre Ward. Right? Andre Ward's one of these guys who has a lot of layers. So if you're looking at Andre Ward and you see Andre Ward being defensive, don't reach the conclusion he's a defensive fighter. No, reach the conclusion that he has worked on that part of his game. So then at other parts of the fight, he's going to be offensive. Now one of the secrets to this fight is an injury Andre Ward had. Right? Understand that Andre Ward had a torn up right shoulder. This is during his career, right? He fought not one fight with it. He fought several fights with it. He doesn't talk about it a lot. What I want you to do, though, is I want you to Google it. Understand Ward had surgery on the shoulder. Understand this shoulder is the reason why we didn't get the opportunity to see Andre Ward against Kelly Pavlik. Right? Understand, Andre Ward's not dodging anybody. There have been times where Andre Ward wanted fights, signed for fights, but then got injured. Well, understand that now the shoulder has been repaired. Now, Andre Ward has the bang back in his right hand. Right? Understand what that means. You know, if you're a basketball player, Andre Ward has spent years going to his left because his right wasn't 100%. Now he has his right back. Guess what? All those skills that he developed going to his left, they're still there. Right? They're still there. So... The fight is going to take place in Ward's backyard, in Oakland. Paul Smith, 
fights a little bit upright. Smith thinks he's a puncher. He's going to come in. He's going to want to trade punches, right? But Smith doesn't have the spacing Andre Ward does. Understand, Andre Ward, you know, is a switch to the extreme. In other words, if Andre Ward wants to stay outside behind a jab, he could do that. If he wants to play an ambush game, he could do that. If he wants to get inside and under Paul Smith, right, and work Paul Smith's body, he could do that, right? I'm not saying Andre's perfect. What I want you to do is look at the Darnell Boone fight. That's right. Darnell Boone, America's best opponent, right? Boone, you know, has dropped more guys than you want to believe, right? Including Andre Ward. And you'll see a fight where Andre Ward gets his bell rung, right? Where Andre lets up momentarily and it costs him. But folks need to realize, and it's a personality type thing. Folks need to realize that while Andre Ward wasn't fighting regular fights while he was inactive due to injury as well as promotional disputes. Andre Ward has been in the gym. Andre Ward has kept himself in shape. For those of you who want to say that Andre Ward lacks power, let's remember that Andre Ward fought the light heavyweight champion and decked him multiple times. Right? Ward is a master at angles. He's a master at spacing. In many ways, I'm expecting this fight to be similar to the Sean Porter Adrian Broner fight. Paul Smith, like Adrian Broner, likes things to be right in front of him. Right? He likes to sit at the chessboard and try to outwork you. Andre Ward, like Sean Porter, moves more around the ring. He understands that when he leaps in, guys who are more local sometimes can't handle that element of surprise. Isn't that what gets the Carl Frotch? Right? Carl Frotch is great if you're right in front of him. Andre Ward stays off at the side, keeps jumping in on counters. Carl's not prepared for. Well, here, Ward is fighting a guy who's not quite as good as Carl Frotch. Right? Carl has that great uppercut. Carl has a pretty good jab. Paul Smith doesn't quite have those tools. So I'm expecting this to be a fight where Ward has a chance at a KO. It's at a catch weight. It's at 172. I'm telling you, Andre Ward hits harder today than he did yesterday. Right? Andre Ward is one of these guys who always keeps himself in shape. Right? Understand the usual rules of ring rust and aging don't quite apply to guys like this. Think Ray Leonard, who was out of the ring three years before he fights Marvin Hagler. Right? Ward is a guy who stays in the gym. Understand, too, Ward's last fight, Edwin Rodriguez. I want you to look at that fight. Rodriguez was supposed to be a puncher. Right? Rodriguez was supposed to be a guy who was going to pressure you and break you. Right? If you look at that fight, you're going to see that Andre Ward used both of those things against him. Right? Ward knew where Rodriguez was going to be. Rodriguez didn't know where Ward was going to be. Ward lands several clean punches to the side of his head while moving around the ring. Right? While dusting off his mobile skills. Ward's much more mobile than Paul Smith. Ward is much more up and down than Paul Smith. In other words, if Ward wants to duck and go to the body and then get back out, he's much more adept at that than Paul Smith. Right? Ward's the better counterpuncher. Ward is better at changing tempo. I'm expecting Andre Ward to win big 
on Paul Smith. What I want people to do, too, is to go back and look at the film of Paul Smith against James DeGale. What you're going to notice is DeGale just ends up moving better than Paul Smith. The Gale's less scripted than Paul Smith. Right? Paul Smith couldn't make the adjustments the Gale was able to. Right? Andre Ward can fight off cadence. We focus on things like hand speed and foot speed. All I'm saying is don't overlook the idea of timing. Right? Andre Ward can vary the timing. I'm expecting Andre Ward to, over time, walk down Paul Smith. I think Smith is going to be surprised by Andre Ward's power, especially at 172. Let me say this, too. When you have an Andre Ward who's been at the same weight for a long period of time, right? He's been fighting at 168 for a long time, right? When a guy like that enters his 30s, and keep in mind, we're talking about a guy who's always in shape, right? You've never seen Andre Ward looking flabby and looking out of shape. He's always in shape. When an Andre Ward gets to his 30s, right, understand Father Time is going to put a few pounds on you, right? Even guys who are in tremendous shape are going to, over time, gain a few pounds and all I'm saying is sometimes staying at the same weight while you're fighting farther time becomes a struggle where you actually start losing punching power in other words it's easier to make 168 at 25 than it is at 31 32 right if you're still making 168 at 31 32 you might be giving up you know, some of the calories your body wants. <clears throat> now, for fighters like that, when they move up a little in weight, sometimes they get back a little bit extra power. Keep in mind, this is a guy who's always in shape. Right? I would say that Ward moving up in weight should have you wondering whether the extra pounds, and I believe the catch weight here is something like 172 pounds. And you know how I feel about catch weights. I'm going to boo here and put a thumbs down on it. But, okay, fine. It's a catch weight. We have to deal with it because it's what the parties have agreed upon. But you need to keep an eye on Ward's punching power. Has it increased with his weight? Is this a situation of a guy who stayed at 168 as long as he can? And now he's going to accept his body's maturation and his body's going to pay him back with a little bit more pop. Keep in mind, Bernard Hopkins, middleweight champion, gained weight. He actually dropped Antonio Tarver. Right? I know it's kind of a surprise knockdown. But it happened. Understand... Same type thing with Babu Chuminov, right? I would argue that Bernard Hopkins, and keep in mind, Hopkins is an extreme case. He is an alien. We're talking about a guy who obviously was in his 40s, right? Late 30s, much older than Ward is now. But it looks to me like Bernard Hopkins' body thanked him for finally leaving the middleweight division, right? Andre is taller than you think, right? It's a little bit surprising he's been able to stay at 168 as long as he has. Pay close attention to his punching power in this fight. Now let's shift gears. Let's talk about social media for a moment. Let me say this. Um, I stumbled upon a video on Dante's Boxing Nation. Now you know it's my belief that a rising tide lifts all boats. I want to support those involved in social media because quite frankly I think it helps all of us here online right and one of the best is Dante's boxing nation it's it's Dante right 
And he has a video up here that's a must-see on the Porter-Adrian Broner fight. Uh, it's so good that it really is a standard setter, right? Dante actually shows up at the Mayweather gym. Um, Dante obviously spends far more time, far much more time than I do in doing videos. Right, Dante shows up at the Mayweather gym and he talks with Adrian Broner. Then there's a sparring session that happens off camera, right? Guys don't want you to see what they're preparing to do. That's fair enough. This is a competitive sport, right? People want the competitive advantage that comes from the element of surprise and secrecy, right? But then Dante actually talks with Broner sparring partners. And, you know, the guys basically say, hey, he's sharp, right? Dante even focuses on who the sparring partners are, right? And the guys candidly say, look, you know, first time I sparred with him, he wasn't this sharp. You know, now he's had eight sparring sessions. He's much sharper, right? They also show you Broner in the ring working out with some of the guys helping him in camp. And they show you how Broner is working on his footwork. He's working on being lighter on his feet. He's backing up a lot more. Okay? Interesting. Right? Then Dante travels a few blocks. And he goes to Sean Porter's camp. Here's where it gets real interesting to me. Right? In Sean Porter's camp is Shane Mosley. In Sean, by the way, in the video, you actually see Mosley giving Sean Porter some advice. Right? Um, also, it's hammering Hank Lundy. Let's just say I was beyond impressed by the guys that Broner picked, excuse me, that the guys that Porter picked as his sparring partners. Right? Shane Mosley, to me, is the perfect sparring partner to have if you're about to fight Adrian Broner. Right? Because just style wise, you know, uh, fast hands. Let's give Sugar Shane credit on that. Very fast hands. Right? Stays in the pocket, just like Broner. Doesn't move around the ring as well as people think, just like Broner. I, I don't mean to diss Shane Mosley. Shane Mosley is a first ballot Hall of Famer, right? Um, but I just thought that it was interesting, the guys they picked, right? Hank Lundy will throw punches from odd angles, just like Broner. I thought Porter's choice of sparring partners were inspired. Right? I know Broner has elite guys, has Emmanuel Taylor. I'm not sure if Taylor's style is Porter's style. Well, let me go one step further. Kenny Porter. Right? Kenny Porter on the Dante video. And it's an A-plus video. Right? Kenny Porter is seen yelling instructions to his son who's off camera. I'm telling you, Kenny Porter lays out the blueprint on how to beat Adrian Broner in that video. Right? You don't even see what Sean Porter's doing. What Kenny Porter is saying is that when Sean Porter jumps inside, it's not going to be the first move that Sean Porter does after he jumps inside that wins him the fight. Because Broner's going to be leaning. He's going to be in the pocket, but he's going to be trying to, you know, Broner's a leaner. He's going to try to lean away from punches. It's not the first move, according to Kenny Porter. The first combination, as he says, that his son throws. 
that's going to be effective. It's not going to be the second combination that his son throws once he gets inside that's going to be effective. According to Kenny Porter, it's the third combination that his son throws that's going to be effective. My point to you is simply this. If you're a leaner, think Ali, think Vitaly Klitschko, right? A guy who guys jump in and you're just leaning back away from punches, right? If you're a leaner, then you have to be someone who, as a guy comes forward, you're able to move backwards, right? You're able to move. In other words, Ali's leans were because he's able to move away from guys, right? He's not standing in the pocket just leaning and thinking that that's enough, right? If you're going to do that, then you better be blessed like James Tony was in terms of figuring out how to, while leaning, throw punches back, right? In this fight, I'm expecting, I believe Porter wins the fight. I'm expecting Porter to jump in, right? There's a suddenness element to me that Broner working on his footwork backing up won't be able to solve. Understand, Broner being reactive and backing up, this is new to him, right? This is not an Andre Ward situation where the guy from day one lays out 10 things that he needs to do in the ring and then goes about developing those skills, right? If Andre Ward were a pitcher, he'd be a Greg Maddox type guy. Right? Have all these pitches. You know, have four or five pitches. Right? Work on being able to get that curve over the plate late in the count. You know what I'm saying? Right? Adrian Broner, by contrast, is great defensively. Has a few specialties. Is a specialist. He's not a guy who, in my opinion, has spent a lot of time developing, right, back foot you know, offense. So Sean Porter, I believe, is going to be outside. It's going to be a bit of an ambush fight. He's going to be outside. There's a suddenness to his game. He's suddenly going to jump in. He's going to be up on Adrian Broner. But where it gets interesting is while he's up on Broner, he's going to come in with a pot shot. Then he's going to try to stay for dinner, right? I'm expecting Porter to come in, flash some footwork, pivot when he's inside. He has to come in with the power shot. I know they're talking about jabs in the video and stuff. I think there's some smoke and mirrors in that video. But he's, he has to come with power shots. Then he needs to figure out. You know, he needs to expect that he's going to have to pivot in the pocket, throw a few punches that might miss Broner but then keep at it. Because when you look at the Marcus Maidana fight, Maidana gets inside on Broner. The thing with Maidana is, Maidana's just a hunter. So he gets inside, then he stays inside, and there's a moment where Broner's defense eventually breaks down. Because unlike Vitali and unlike Ali, right, guys who leaned and stuff, Broner, to me, doesn't have the ability to then back out of there or to throw punches on his back foot while he's backing out of there, right? So um, let me strongly recommend that Dante's video. Let me say this, too, if people haven't talked about it. So there was a press conference. And Broner, who fancies himself as an Ali, crosses the line, right? Broner views himself as an entertainer, but understand there, there are limits to the entertainment, right? There are. I personally feel that as Broner gets older, he's going to figure this out, but right now, you know, he's a young guy. Right? The limelight's still relatively new 
to Adrian Broner. I don't care how much hype he's gotten. I don't care how many belts he's gotten. Right? You can tell that the limelight's relatively new to him. Right? So, rather than tell Sean Porter how he's going to bust him up in the ring and crack jokes about it. Hey, that's fair. This is boxing. This is about busting people up in the ring. Right? That's cool. He then has to cross the line. Right? Crosses the line. And then he starts talking about Porter's father. What's that about? Then he starts talking about Porter's woman. What's that about? Right? So, you know, people are laughing because, of course, who are the people around Adrian Broner? A lot of them are being paid by Adrian Broner. Right? So they're laughing. And, of course, some of the other people in the background, they're making money off Adrian Broner. Right? So Adrian Broner could say Old McDonald had a farm and five or six people will laugh. Right? That doesn't mean he's being funny here. That doesn't mean that we, the viewer, aren't looking at him and aren't pitying him for the fact that dude's so desperate for attention he has to cross the line. Well, let me say this. It's interesting. Because then Kenny Porter, and understand who Kenny Porter is, he's not a disinterested dad. He's actually the trainer of Sean Porter, right? Understand, you know, Kenny Porter is involved in boxing management and training, right? So Kenny Porter is there listening to this young guy trying to diss him, trying to imply that he is financially exploiting his son. I'm just wondering how Adrian Broner thought this was going to be entertaining, but that's another story, right? Well, put it this way. Kenny Porter then talks back. Now, I know on many of these videos, they're saying, oh, it's a shame that, you know, Adrian Broner got under Kenny Porter's skin. You know what? It's not a shame. Because I thought what Kenny Porter then says is something young fighters need to consider carefully now understand this is the top of the game right uh, these guys are gonna be on PBC right um, you know these guys both of these guys have had belts both of these guys you know had success in the past big success right I know Sean Porter was brilliant in the amateurs for example right both of these guys have had big money behind them. They're well connected. Obviously, Al Heyman is behind PBC, right? I believe the fights are going to be on NBC. In other words, this is the elite part of the game. This is not the club fighter level, right? So these guys are already two of the fortunate few to have made meaningful money in the sport of boxing. But Kenny Porter responds to Adrian Broner. I don't think Broner was ready for this. By the way, while Broner's talking a lot of, you know, private stuff that isn't really that relevant, Kenny Porter is highly relevant. You know it's my belief that there's no money in boxing for most, right, for most. That a few guys at the top make practically all the dollars. And that the economics really doesn't work out for most. So, Kenny Porter starts talking back to Adrian Broner, right? Young guy who thinks he's bulletproof. Young guy who, you know, is talking about his opponent's woman and how his father's driving a good car, but yet Sean Porter is driving a lesser car, as if you know, multi-millionaires in the United States don't live frugally, right? Well, it's well, it's deep because Kenny Porter then says, hey, how much are you paying in child support? Now, let me just say, I do divorce work. I'm a divorce attorney. I've garnished wages in the past, right? Let's just say Kenny Porter starts talking about Adrian Broner's child support obligations. Keep in mind, that's fair game because Broner's silly enough to be talking about the personal lives of Sean Porter and Kenny Porter. So Kenny Porter basically starts talking about, you know, 
Adrian Broner's child support obligations. Then he goes further. Here's where it gets to the A-plus level. He then says, how much are you really making in this fight? He says, you factor in the child support. How much are you paying your trainer? Then he says, that's 10%. Your promoter, keep in mind, Floyd Mayweather's on the stage. He says, your promoter, that's 20%. Your sparring partners, right? Keep in mind the economic model that the porters have, right? Doesn't have all of these third parties involved, right? It's a father and son team. Keep in mind, too, Sean Porter isn't getting wages garnished, right? He doesn't have to pay a lot of child support obligations. Young fighters need to think about the economic consequences of all of that early in their careers, right? You need to think about, seriously, family planning and all of that early on right the porters have I think it's an interesting moment right I think it's a very interesting moment and so let me just say this I like Porter in the fight I'll agree that Broner has a puncher's chance in part because the fight is at a bogus 144 catch weight folks I'm not a fan of catch weights. If you're expecting me to be here being an in-house analyst type saying, oh, catch weights, oh, aren't we so lucky? Hey, I'm on the other side of the street. If you want to fight at the 147-pound weight class, you should not have restrictions on your opponent's ability to come in at 147 pounds, right? I mean, that's the bottom line. You know, then these rehydration clauses... Look, all I'm saying is, you know, if your opponent's able to come in and make weight, that should be enough, right? After the weigh-in, I'm surprised guys have strings on their opponent's ability to rehydrate. That's ridiculous, right? So let me just say, I strongly recommend Dante's Boxing Nation. I strongly recommend that you also look at clips of the press conference where Kenny Porter blows up. Understand, Kenny Porter isn't just a fan of boxing. Understand that Kenny Porter is the trainer for Sean Porter. Right? I want young guys to think about the economics of boxing on the front end before they're in there getting knocked out and risking their health. Right? Um, I also want you to just consider the fact that Andre Ward right now might hit harder than he ever has. I know John Pascal has said that Andre Ward is going to face some bumps in the road if he comes up to 175 pounds, right? I'll concede that 175 pounds is going to be one hell of a ride for all of us, right? But just understand that Ward might look bigger, quicker, faster, stronger at 172 than he has at 168 right when you see a fighter who's been at the same weight for as long as Andre Ward has been right understand sometimes when he gains weight to get to that next weight class and they're doing it cautiously here right sometimes that actually adds speed and power I like Ward over Paul Smith I like Porter over Broner I am gonna hedge the Broner, excuse me, the Porter pick with Broner by KO simply because the odds allow it and I'm just going to try to play it safe. But understand the risk involved here. Right? What I'm saying is that if this fight goes to a decision, I don't expect the problem to win it. I expect Sean Porter to win the fight. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.